Uh, elimination of paper copies of the UPA. So that'll be fully uh, electronic. Companies required to make it available on whatever their uh, electronic flight um, EFB device is. A second jump seat on new aircraft. So if there's an option for a second jump seat and the company um, does not get it, declines to order that second jump seat option, a cabin seat will be available for United Pilot. And then the, there's a limitation that you have to make the request at least 20 minutes prior to departure. Um, otherwise, it would have released that seat. <clears throat> Minimum crew complement. So the current language just requires two pilots on the airplane. And the uh, change will require that they actually be on the flight deck. So you have enough pilots to always, always have two on the flight deck. A commuter policy. So if, if you recall, there are actually a series of communicator provisions that have mostly have already been briefed to you. So keeping those in mind, there was kind of a holistic package, if you think about it that way. Getting um, the uh, hotel and positive space rights was all a part of that. So in addition to that, um, a pilot now, if you bought a ticket or if you have a positive space ticket, you will not be required to uh, have that second backup flight. Uh, as long as you have made the booking or purchase at least 12 hours prior to report time and the scheduled arrival time has an, a 90 minute buffer with uh, the, whatever time you're supposed to be available. Um, a reserve will be uh, able to use that first 2.5 hours of a short call call out to actually arrive in place. So in other words, your commuter flight can arrive during the 2.5 hours that you would be needed to report. You, you communicate with the company and say, hey, I'll be in place within 2.5. If you have anything for me, I'll find out when I get there. Um, the, uh, the balance to that is that if a pilot misses a trip, um, especially without having that backup flight, the PPU that's associated with the trip that touches that missed trip would be uh, stripped. So it's uh, the trip, the pilot can still make up the flying that they would have missed through the, you know, the, the prudent commuter policy is still no harm, no foul, uh, but you lose the flying that you had. Um, you know, if you, if you miss it, you lose the pay for the flying uh, and, but you're still able to make it up. A company failure to provide a compliant seat. So uh, going forward, uh, if you decide that, hey, that seat is not something I'm willing to accept, and I'm going to force the company to now book me later on, today it's questionable how you get treated, but mañana, after October 1st, that will be a reassignment, essentially, as far as how it's treated, which means that now you're eligible for overtime pay. Um, and if you're a line holder, 20N day off restoration uh, reserves, all they're, they're always at MDO. Medical privacy autonomy. All right, so nothing beyond what the FAA requires to hold a medical, including your special issuance. Um, and unless it's required elsewhere in the UPA, uh, the, the company cannot require a, um, a uh, additional medical information to be shared. Uh, when we say elsewhere in the UPA, obviously if you're applying for LTD, that's a different standard. You're gonna have to share more information. Um, new option, if you're returning to work after a leave of 30 days or more, there's a procedure you have to go through getting cleared by company medical. And if that is something that makes you feel uncomfortable now, what you can do is go to your FAA doc, get an updated certificate, give that to the company, and that puts you into that first bullet. No medical procedure, nothing required beyond your medical uh, to tell the company that you're, you're fit to fly. Mm -hmm. And continuing with uh, medical privacy and autonomy. So uh, this mirrors roughly, it's not exactly the same, uh, but it mirrors roughly the way that Delta handled it. For those of you that are familiar with that, uh, again, as, uh, as Andy keeps reminding you all, we, you know, this wasn't uh, on the Costco shopping list necessarily. We tried to design this for what, uh, with LEC input, officer input as to what our pilots uh, wanted. We do a couple things differently at different stages that we think are more advantageous for incumbent pilots that are in place in the category that might be affected by this. And I'll walk you through these bullets and see if that makes sense. So we have a definition for a governmental restriction or an operational impact. The governmental restriction is outside of United's control, right? That's a foreign destination country that puts a requirement in place that United can't do anything about. It's just there. Yellow fever comes to mind. That's a similar situation. And an operational impact uh, narrowed it down so that it's not just whatever the company thinks, but it has to be a disruption to, as it uh, lists here, report, release, uh, duty limits that, that kind of carve out that pilot that might be restricted, makes them different from the rest of the crew. 
uh, can't take a layover transportation. Some countries have imposed that in the past. Um, and uh, due to, and, and again, the reasons for that, vaccination, medical procedure, medical requirement, that was generally due to vaccination status during COVID when that happened. Um, so a medically unqualified pilot is a pilot who was assigned a restricted uh, segment, but has not provided documentation um, about medical records that would establish that, uh, that that pilot is qualified. That goes back to the protection that you don't have to give the company anything beyond your FAA medical or your special issuance. So the way that that works, though, is that if you, if the company needs to know whether you have a yellow fever vaccine or some other requirement, you don't have to tell them. But then we have to have a procedure for for you know you obviously can't fly trips that are required by either an outside entity or or that um, operational impact you won't be able to fly those trips. So how do, so how do we fix that? So you, will, you won't be placed, so protections and limitations. So you won't be placed on dependability monitoring if you're removed from a restricted segment. Um, you will also kind of stepping further back, uh, you will not be awarded a vacancy or displacement into a category that has restricted segments that are relevant to you. Um, you also not be awarded a trip trade that goes into restricted segments. Um, and and uh, but you get freebies. When this happens, you're protected uh, until the third bid period when you have a trip removed. In that case, uh, then uh, a further step of procedures, um, which and this is something that Delta didn't do. They they start the uh, whatever their remedies are. They do them right away. Uh, so we actually give you a grace period to decide. Okay, either get out of the uh, the the bid, get the get the whatever it is that's making you uh, uh, not eligible for these restricted segments or uh, live with this, which is that if your a trip is removed for restricted segments, then PBS will be adjusted to um, prevent those from being awarded to you unless it goes into completion mode. So if it can't do anything else, it'll end up in completion mode. Um, and in the, so once your schedule is, is ongoing, so no earlier than 24 hour, hours after the start of trip trading, uh, you'll have trips removed, and and, and this time because now we're, we're we're getting closer to the day of the operation, you've had an opportunity to use trip trading to remove those trips from your schedule. Uh, they will end up becoming dropped without pay and blocked. So that's a drop drop and block will be the vernacular for that term. That's what was happening uh, during COVID. What that is doing is, uh, um, and then. Let me see, and blocked from adding additional flying within 14 days of departure of the restricted segment. So the complaint we got during COVID for, uh, from the pilots that were the incumbent pilots remaining in the categories that had pilots that were uh, uh, trying to manage through these restrictions was that pilots were bidding these on purpose, putting them back into open flying, and then picking up everything else because they couldn't pick up those trips again. So what we're trying to do here is prevent the harm from transferring from the affected pilot because there is harm at first and the trying to protect the freedoms of that pilot with regard to documentation being provided to the company and all that but at some point that harm transfers over to the remaining pilots in that pilot's category so this is uh, an attempt to give a timeline for things to happen for the pilot to be able to have some control and and uh, uh, make decisions that affect uh, you know their own uh, well-being and quality of life but limiting that from hurting or damaging the quality of life of the pilots remaining in that category. Um, if a TDY category has restricted segments and not enough medically qualified pilots to cover the flying, the, uh, the uh, company will have the right to deny TDY requests from medically unqualified pilots. Normally those go in seniority order. They would still have to honor them and then give the pilots the timeline that we were just talking about to trade out of anything they might get and so on and so forth. But if it gets to the point where there aren't enough pilots, uh, in seniority order to fill those uh, segments or to fly those segments, then the company can skip them. Uh, cleanup items in 21, uh, FFDO, uh, positive space travel will also uh, enjoy the deviation uh, um, uh, improvements that other positive space travel benefits are enjoying. And uh, we have a, a crew scheduling system functionality minimum that's being updated from 2012 as far as what uh, we wanna see in CCS, as far as uh, bells and whistles and features.